Hi everybody, uh, welcome uh, in uh, MATED. Uh, we are uh, very happy today that uh, so much people have uh, been interested in this uh, uh, in, uh, in this uh, seminar because uh, the topic of uh, open educational resources and uh, how they are related to a, fr a relevant framework as uh, Creative Commons uh, is, uh, is something uh, very relevant for uh, our project uh, of uh, innovation in didactics. And uh, we have uh, really the big chance to have uh, today uh, here Dr. Cable Green, Director of Open Education Creative Commons. Thank you very much uh, for, uh, being, uh, for being uh, here. Uh, Dr. Cable Green, uh, uh, he is uh, really one of the main uh, responsible of the spread of the culture of uh, the Creative Commons uh, all over the world, and particularly in uh, uh, the sector of uh, education, and uh, more specifically in the sector of higher education. And uh, we uh, met uh, him uh, because uh, he helped us uh, in uh, the development uh, of the MOOC uh, about uh, open education uh, resources uh, in uh, teaching that uh, we have uh, on our portal, Polymy of Open Knowledge. We have here yeah, Paola Corti, that is uh, the instructional designer that has uh, designed this uh, MOOC and uh, thank you to Cable Green, uh, the other testimonials and particularly to Paola Corti, we gained uh, a, a very uh, a relevant uh, global award uh, uh, for this MOOC and uh, for its contribution uh, to the spread of uh, the uh, open education culture. So um, I can leave uh, now the floor to uh, Dr. Cable Green. Thank you very much. Uh, please. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> There's more seats over here if anybody would like to use them. Uh, first, my apologies for not knowing your language. Uh, languages are not my strong point, so I will be speaking in English if that's OK. I know a little Swahili, some Spanish to get by. And I'm trying to learn my Italian to say thank you and good morning. And <laughs> but thank you for having me. Um, with, I do travel around the world often, but this, believe it or not, is my first time in Italy. So it's a real honor uh, to be here. <clears throat> and I will be enjoying your uh, downtown Milan tomorrow. Uh, and I look forward to that. Uh, next week, I, and then I'm leaving, and I'll begin Slovenia, uh, where we'll be hosting the World OER Global Congress uh, where ministers of education from around the world, including yours uh, here from Italy, will be convening for three days next week and talking uh, as at a national level about what governments can do to support open education. So I'll be in, uh, be in Europe for the next week or so and then uh, off to somewhere else. I'm not sure where. I have to check my schedule. Uh, I should also uh, start with, I am an American, and I'd like to apologize for Donald Trump. Uh, <laughs> I did not vote for Donald Trump, so let's just get that out of the way, and we can be friends and move forward. Uh, this is my contact information. If you, if we don't have enough time, although we do have a good amount of time today to talk, and, I'll, and please ask questions as we're going through the slides. You don't have to wait until the end. So let's have a conversation. Uh, but if you want to talk more, that's my email, cable at creativecommons.org. And for any of you that do Twitter or other social media, my handle is at cgreen on Twitter. And that's a good place to keep up with what, not only what I'm doing, but what others around the world are doing in open education. Um, of course, all of these slides and the recording that we're doing will be up on YouTube is all under a Creative Commons attribution license. If you don't know what that means now, that's OK. You certainly will by the end of this conversation. Uh, essentially, this means you can use it in any way you want, for free, forever. You can make changes to it. Um, all you have to do is give me attribution. That just, you just give me credit. You point back and say, I got this from Cable Green. Other than that, do whatever you want to do with the slides. I hope they're useful. 
Um, so I, before we get into, we'll, we'll talk about uh, open education, we'll talk about open licensing and what that means and how the academy is changing. But before I go into that, uh, Europe is a bit special uh, in its history as compared to other parts of the world. Uh, mainly that Europe has a long history of open universities. And not open in the sense of licensing content, but open in the sense of open admissions, of making sure that there's an equal opportunity for all citizens of countries to participate in higher education. So there's gr this great history of uh, open universities across, uh, across uh, Europe, Europe and uh, the United Kingdom and others. Um, there's also um, uh, a great history of uh, providing equity and opportunity to citizens to higher education. This is a small list and not a complete list of some of the recent areas in which Europe, uh, including Italy, has been a real leader uh, in open education. Certainly in OER, the content, which we'll talk about that today, um, Europe is probably the leading voice right now in talking about, uh, in Europe they call it open praxis, the rest of the world calls it open pedagogy or open practices, uh, new ways of teaching and learning, new approaches uh, in the classroom because of the open content that we have. Uh, and we'll talk more about uh, what some of that looks like. Uh, a lot of uh, open education research uh, is coming out of the Open University in the United Kingdom. They've got something called the OER Research Hub. Um, open licensing policies, uh, we'll go into detail about this later, but this is essentially uh, policy work that's being done around funding but also around uh, policies that encourage and support faculty and teachers that want to move toward open education. Uh, for example, the Erasmus Plus uh, grant program out of the European Union has an open license requirement on it. So all of that money is optional. Nobody is forced to apply for an Erasmus grant if you don't want to. But if you do, uh, they have an open license requirement that says if you take this money, whatever you build, you have to share with everybody else in Europe because it was European money that funded this. Um, so that's an example of European leadership there. Um, open access, as I, I understand your institution uh, here at the Polytechnic has an open access uh, policy where the faculty uh, still do the research they want, they publish where they want, but there's a copy uh, of the articles. These are all free right here. <laughs> That's okay. Um, there's there's uh, acts so that anybody in the world can access this research. Um, metadata standards to be able to find all this stuff easier. And copyright reform. The European Union right now is debating uh, its copyright laws and trying to figure out should there be additional exceptions and limitations on copyright for educators and for librarians and, and other education uses. And there's a a big debate right now between the educators that want more access uh, for their students and for educators and uh, from commercial interests which want less access. So there's a real fight happening right now uh, in the EU over copyright reform. Uh, you've also got these grand institutions like uh, Communia, which, anybody know Communia? No? Oh, you need to look this up. You should, this is a, uh, a proud European effort to uh, link the, uh, the cultural arts museums and archives and libraries of Europe and expose their great works and the, da the data about them uh, to the public. And they put an open license on, on those resources as well. And then projects like opening up Slovenia. The Slovenians have been longtime leaders in this, which is why they're hosting the world next week and all the ministers of education from around the planet to talk more about these topics. Um, so I guess my first thing to say is thank you, Europe, for leading the world in these topics. Uh, uh, the leadership is appreciated and the rest of us are following your lead. Um, so now, before we get started, I want to talk about just a few of the basics. Why do we, we'll get to what open education is and all that in a minute. We'll get to definitions. But why do we, why are we even in this room together? Why are we having this conversation about uh, open access to research, open educational resources. Um, the reason is, is that the, the tools that we use in education have fundamentally changed in the last 15 years. So if you think way back uh, to the beginning of how you access knowledge, if you go way back, uh, you were somebody that had to be able to travel to a monastery and you had, you'd better be able to read Latin 
to access the books that were handwritten and hand copied, and that was a very small percentage of the population. Then we moved into an era where we had the great libraries of the world, but still, you had to travel to those. Whether or not you could check a book out was determined on what class you were in society, um, but access was still relatively limited. Uh, then we, of course, got the Gutenberg Press, and we were able to print copies and distribute uh, copies of printed materials all around the world. That revolutionized access to knowledge and information. And then uh, just about 15 years ago, things changed again in a very fundamental way. Uh, three big things happened. The first one was the world went digital. We went digital because computers got cheap, disk space became really cheap, and we got cloud computing. And so if you think back to the early 2000s, that was the time when most of us, for the first time, were able to afford a computer in our, in our homes. Uh, it was the first time you started to get computers in your offices, uh, if you, for most faculty. Computer science faculty probably had them before that. Engineers had it a little bit before. But for the rest of us, computers finally got cheap enough, affordable enough, that we could, we could have one. Um, the second thing that happened was the internet. Um, certainly, the internet's more than 15 years old. Uh, or at least the, the beginnings of it. But when you, when, what I mean is the, the web and the way that we use it today really started to become functional for us in education in the early 2000s, late 1990s. Uh, and the third thing that happened was, was Creative Commons, but I'll get to that in a moment. Digital is important. And of course, let me say, uh, there are a lot of resources we use today in education that are print. Or, or are in other media that are not digital, but for about the last 15 years, everything we have in education has a digital file somewhere. So you might hand out printed copies in your class of particular materials, but there's a digital file sitting behind it. Digital is important because digital things can be stored, copied, and distributed for near zero cost. It's not quite zero. Now, production costs are still very high. Costs a lot of money to build a new textbook. We all know this. Costs a lot of money and time to build a new course or a degree program. It costs a lot of money and time to build a new song, a new piece of music, or a symphony, or a movie, or whatever it might be. But once you've got that digital file, once that thing has been produced, the costs of storing it on a disk somewhere, the cost of making copies of it, and the cost of distributing it over the internet, those costs have fallen to near zero. And that's what this chart really shows. The cost of copying a book is now tens of thousandths of a euro in cost. So we actually did this experiment at Creative Commons. We took a 350-page chemistry textbook, and we uploaded it into the Amazon cloud, and we put in our credit card number, and we gave a whole bunch of people the the link so they could download it and use this openly licensed textbook. And we just were interested in the costs. How much did that cost every month to store it and to make copies of it as people downloaded it? And it's about these numbers. It's literally tens of thousands of a cent to make copies and distribute it. And so that's not quite free, but it's pretty close. You have 40,000 students here, yes. right? So you take 40,000 students and multiply it by one of these numbers and you probably have enough money in your, in your wallet or purse that you could buy every student a chemistry textbook. Right? So that was different. Uh, in an age of print, uh, even to print something, to ship a printed book, to store a printed book, those were all expensive things. So the economics of sharing knowledge fundamentally changed when things went digital. Second thing that happens, we got the internet, so all these digital things that we could share at near zero cost, it's really easy to share them and at near speeds of light over the web, over the internet. So that was different. We've never had that before. <laughs> and that, of course, in music led us to things like Napster and other things which were illegal, but your students didn't care. They did it anyway, and so did students in my country, uh, because it was, it was cheap and easy to share digital files. The third thing that uh, that came along was, was open licensing, but, but let me go through these slides here. So what the internet enabled, what digital enabled was this. We could spend 500,000 or a million euros building a really fabulous uh, Chemistry 101 textbook and pay a team of chemistry professors from around Europe to build that textbook with an EU grant. It could be digital. We could share it with everybody on the planet for near zero cost. 
But we've got this thing called copyright. So all this cheap copying and distribution and storage is great until you're violating the law and somebody's rights, and that's not okay. We don't wanna be illegal in our activities. And so um, when we talk about Open Educational Resources, or OER, we mean something very specific. So when we're talking about educational resources, we mean everything that we use in the classroom, everything we use in our courses, our degree programs at the university, uh, textbooks, syllabi, lesson plans, assessments, simulations, video, anything that you're using with your students to help them learn. Those are educational resources. By open, we mean something very specific. We mean first that students, or anybody else for that matter, can have free and unfettered access to those resources. Now by free, I really mean free. I mean no cost access to the resource. And that everybody's got free copyright permissions to download, modify, and share the resource. So without asking permission, I can make a copy, I can edit it, I can translate it from Italian into German if I want to, because I, maybe I work in Munich, and I can throw away chapter two because I don't like chapter two, and I can write a new chapter two, but I can modify it to meet the needs of my class and my students. You've got to have those legal rights. So open is not the same as free. Most of what you find on the internet is freely available. I mean, you're paying for it with ads and with your eyeballs and attention and all that, but it doesn't, there, nobody's charging you money to access most of the things on the web. Free is assumed online. Open is different than free, and we say it's better than free because open is free plus permissions. And the permissions that we're talking about are these. So we call these the five R's. This comes from a professor named David Wiley who came up with this catchy list. But it's the legal rights to retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. So retain is you get to keep a copy. And as obvious as that sounds, the world that we live in and the world that the commercial publishers are driving us toward does not allow faculty or your students to retain a copy. So the new model, because publishers want to make a first sale, and by the way, I'm not here to bash publishers. We partner with publishers often. I'm just criticizing the existing models that we have that limit access to educational resources in inefficient ways. That's what I'm critical of. Uh, today, the new model is that, uh, that the publishers are leasing access to students. And at the end of the semester or at the end of the school year, the access that your students have to those math resources or those physics resources or design resources, they lose access when the students stop paying the lease fee. Open resources, uh, as opposed to that, say, here's a copy. You can keep the copy forever. Nobody's ever going to take it away from you. It's yours. The second legal right is the right to reuse it. So now that I've got a copy, I can retain it. I can use it as it is. Nobody's gonna take it away from me. Um, and I can use it in ways that it was intended as it was developed or in different ways. It's up to me how I wanna use it. Revise is I wanna change it somehow. I wanna modify it. Remix is I wanna take that resource that I downloaded that you made available under an open license and take a little bit of this MIT physics course and a little bit of this physics course from the University of Barcelona, which also is openly licensed, and some of my own content. And I'm gonna remix it together like I'd remix music, but create something new from a whole bunch of different sources. And then redistribute that new thing that I've produced. I'm gonna share it forward with other physics professors around the world, okay? All of these things require that you've got the legal rights to do those things. And if something is all rights reserved copyright, you can't do these, okay? So retain and re redistribute, let you download and share it with other people for free, revise and remix, let you change it, improve it, collaborate with others, and reuse it, again, in any way that you want to. So this idea of retain um, is really critical because the new trends that we're seeing in education are that people don't get to retain a copy, which is, Highly problematic if you're a student. Maybe I'm a math major and I just took algebra and geometry and now I'm going into pre-calculus, but my materials have been taken away from me. 
Uh, I have two young children in the public education system in the United States, and because uh, the, the states buy the textbooks and other curricular materials for the kids, but they buy them once every 10 years. And so on average, our content's about 10 years out of date. What they do is they, they move the books from class to class. And so when my children left sixth grade, or when one of them left sixth grade and went to seventh grade, they took away all of his materials. He wasn't allowed to keep a copy of any of it because it was all print. And now that he's in seventh grade, he's got materials that are about eight years old because they can't afford to update that for another two or three years. Right, so it's a, it's a lousy system, but this idea of retain is, is critical. So what the, when I say watch out for artificial scarcity models, by artificial scarcity, <clears throat> what I mean is today we live in an age of information abundance. Uh, and we all know this. There's more information out there in the world than has ever existed in human history. A lot of it is garbage. A lot of what we do in universities is to teach people what's quality information and what's not. We teach critical thinking skills. We teach them information literacy skills so that they can find and weed out good information. But nevertheless, we don't live in an age of information scarcity anymore. We live in a world of abundance. The business models that have ex grown up over the last 200 years grew up in an age of scarcity. And so we are still subject to these old models which put bottlenecks on information. Open is the opposite of that. Open says, let's start from the presumption of abundance and let's create economic models and funding models that take advantage of abundance and not scarcity. So if you think about <clears throat> all of the resources that you use at your university, it's, it's a real mix of things. You, you use commercial publisher resources, you use library resources, uh, some of which are open, some of which are not, and you use probably some open educational resources. These are things that are either openly licensed or they're in the public domain. And that's a good thing, and, my, and I think that even 20 years from now when we have a lot more open happening, it's still gonna be the same mix. There will always be a role for commercial publishers. There will always be a role for libraries that uh, subscribe to commercial resources that only your students get access to, and there's a rule for open. But what's important to look at are these cells here, the cost to students and the permissions that faculty have against those resources. So with commercial resources, they're expensive, and I'll talk in a minute about the negative effects that that's having on university students all around the world. Uh, it's also expensive, it, and then for faculty, the permissions are restricted. So if you uh, are faculty and you're using commercial all rights reserved resources in your class, and you don't quite like chapter seven, or you don't like the order of something, you may or may not, the publisher might have made it easy for you to edit, more often than not, they don't give you those permissions. The content's oftentimes locked down with digital rights management where you can't change it. And if you change it without permission, you're violating their copyright, which can put you in legal jeopardy with them. So oftentimes you don't have the permissions you need, but with open, you do. Uh, with library resources, a lot of times uh, libraries will subscribe to databases or to other resources, and it's free for the faculty and the students at that university. But if I go to Rome or if I go to Naples or other cities, if, because they're not part of your license agreement, they can't access the same resources that your students can access. Right? So we would say that's, that's free but not open. And then open educational resources, you get both. You get free access, you, everybody gets access, and you, the faculty, have the legal rights to modify resources as you see fit. So I talked about digital and we talked about the internet, here's the third piece, and it's open licensing. So early 2000s, people started to share stuff. People started to share music. People started to share movies, digital movies, documentary films, things like that. People started to share, share educational resources. But then the librarians and the lawyers and other people that were expert in copyright got involved and said, well, wait a minute, you can't share that. That's all rights reserved copyright, or you can't use that in your class. Um, I don't care what your friend in Australia said, that's all rights reserved copyright. And without a license to use it, we don't have permission, and therefore you can't use it. Right? And we, I heard this, I was faculty at Ohio State University at the time, and I had an online class, and I had friends in Perth, Australia that wanted to use my class, and I said, of course you can use my class, here are all the files, and they said, Cable, 
We can't use it. It says all rights reserved, Ohio State University at the bottom of the web page. You have to write us a license. And I said, what's that? I'm not a lawyer. And they said, well, go to the lawyers at Ohio State. And I walked in and they said, you're just an assistant professor. We don't have time for you. Get out of our office. And uh, so I was stuck. I, I was a willing educator who wanted to share. I wanted other people to look at my work, improve it, give me new ideas. But there was no way to do it legally. Enter Creative Commons. Cre this is where I work. Creative Commons is a, a global nonprofit uh, organization. We are truly global. We don't have an office anywhere. Our offices are the laptops on the airplanes that we're on. Uh, our CEO is in Canada, he's in Toronto, I live in the United States. We've got uh, staff in Chile, in Santiago, Chile, in Nairobi, Kenya, we're, all, we're in Seoul, South Korea. We're all over the place. Creative Commons started in 2001. We build uh, the open copyright licenses that the world uses to share copyrighted works when they want to share. So not everybody wants to share, and that's okay. For the faculty member that says, hey, I'm writing a new textbook, and my intention is to uh, publish it with a publisher and make a bunch of money on royalties, to that faculty member, I say, great, go do that. I wish you the best of luck. For the faculty member that says, hey, you know, I, um, I've met a lot of faculty that have tried to write textbooks and they didn't sell or they only sold a few copies, but they, was, they think it's a really good book and they want a lot of people to use it, that's a great candidate to put an open license on it and share it. I also meet faculty all over the world who say, Cable, the reason I got into education uh, is that education is about sharing. It's about sharing knowledge. It's about helping as many people learn what I know as possible and, the, and I wanna use all the tools of the day, the internet, things being digital and open licensing, to share what I know with as many people as I can. And so that's really our job. Uh, we've got teams in 86 countries, including Italy. We've got a team called CC Italy. Um, that's growing at about one country per month, right there. Uh, our intention is to have all of the countries in the next two years. Um, these people are um, heads of museums, university faculty, lawyers, copyright lawyers, uh, musicians. The team, in, my favorite team is in Ghana, uh, it's one of the um, people that works in the Ministry of Education. She also works at the big university in Ghana. And when she shows up, she wears these like long, elegant robes. She looks like a minister. And then next to her is a rap artist, a music rap artist who has gold chains around his neck. They both teach people about Creative Commons in Ghana. He shares his music under an open license and gives it away for free. Um, he doesn't sell his music because people were just pirating his music and stealing it anyway. He gives it away for free now because now everybody listens to his music because the cell phone companies took his music, turned it into ringtones on the phones because it was free. And now everybody wants to go to his concerts because his music is playing on the radio all the time. And he makes a bunch of money that way. He sells t-shirts and hats. She, she teaches about because she wants more people to get an education. So we've got these interesting teams all over the world. Creative Commons was created because there was nothing in the middle between copyright and public domain. So does anybody here know how long it takes for a copyrighted work to get into the public domain in Italy? What? 70 years. 70 years is correct, but what has to happen first? To you. If you're the author, what has to happen to you? What? You have to die, that's right. <laughs> so this is unfortunate, right? I'm a faculty member, I'd like to share, uh, but first I'm gonna have to die. And then after I'm dead, 70 years have to go by, and now my work is available for you to use. It's in the public domain. Okay, so that's one way to share. I personally, I'd like to share when I'm still around, uh, but that's how, work, that's how works get into the public domain if you don't do anything. Um, and there are ways for corporations to keep things under copyright for even longer than 70 years. If you're in Mexico, by the way, it's life plus 100 years. I don't know why you have to be dead for an extra 30 years, but you do in Mexico. The, the question was, what if, you want, what if you're the copyright holder and you want to be alive and you want to keep your copyright, you don't want to give up your ownership, you want to keep the copyright, and you want to put a license on your work and share it 
under the terms and conditions that you choose. So this is not one license, there are options. And so these are the choices. All of the creative, and I should say, all of everything I'm showing you here is, is free. There's no cost. I'm not here to sell you anything. Uh, creative, uh, you're probably wondering, oh, this all sounds nice, Cable, but how do you exist? Who pays your salary? Uh, creative Commons is funded by uh, foundations around the world. Uh, and then we do projects that people give us money for where they're on mission for us. So for example, we just built uh, a new certificate program for librarians uh, in North America to teach librarians about open education and uh, Creative Commons licensing. And that was funded by the uh, Institute for Museum Library and Science. So we, we took a grant from them to do that work because that was on mission. So that's how we get money. But all these licenses that I'll show you are free. They always will be free. And the reason I can tell you that is we've actually dedicated our licenses and all of our other tools to the public domain. So you don't have to wait for us to die in 70 years to go by. They're already in the public domain. If we went away tomorrow, everything I'm showing you here will exist forever. So as an author, as faculty who hold copyright to what you build, uh, if you choose to share, here are your options. The first one is not an option. If somebody uses your work, they have to give you attribution or they have to give you credit. And in the academy, we understand that. Uh, if you use somebody else's work, you cite them. If you don't, what do we call that? Plagiarism, Plagiarism right? <laughs> Plagiarism is a problem in the academy. It will get you fired. And so we don't do that. And so in the academy, we say attribution, of course, not a problem. The other three are optional. Share alike means if you take my work, if you take my slide deck, or you take my textbook, or you take my video, or whatever I've shared, and you change it somehow, if I've put an attribution share-alike license on my work, your new version, your changed version of my work must be licensed under the same terms as the original. So everything on Wikipedia, for example, is under an attribution share-alike license. If you change a Wikipedia article, your contribution is automatically licensed under the attribution share-alike license. So that's a way <coughs> to force sharing forward, if that's your intention, okay? Non-commercial is what it sounds, sounds like. You can use my work for free, you can change it, but you can't sell it. Now, no, uh, well, I'll get to that in a minute. So that's non-commercial. No derivatives is you can use my work for free, you can make copies of it, you can share it, but you may not change it. No derivatives, no changes. In education, we don't like that license. We don't like that choice because educators change stuff, right? Even if you took, if you downloaded uh, one of MIT's courses, all courses at MIT are, are under a Creative Commons license. If you downloaded one today, probably the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is to translate it into Italian or some other language. And no derivatives would say, no, you can't do that. No changes to it, you can't modify it, you can't translate it, you have to leave it alone. And so as it, it, most professors say, okay, that's not, not useful to me. So in education, we try not to use no derivatives. When you, when you take these different conditions and you mix them up into different combinations, you get one of six Creative Commons licenses. So again, you keep your copyright, and you, you're giving the world, you're giving the public a license to do certain things with your work and not certain things. So for example, the CC BY license is the attribution license. That says do anything you want, you just have to give me credit. The BY SA license is attribution share alike. Do anything you want, but if you change it, you have to share your changes forward under the same license. BY NC would be attribution non-commercial. And then you've got attribution, no derivatives. By NCSA is attribution, non-commercial, share alike. When we're talking about open education, some of these licenses are okay for education and some are not. And the two no derivatives licenses are not open educational resources. The reason is that for something to be an open educational resource, as we said before, it must be freely available and you have to have the legal rights to do the five R's. And two of the R's are revise and remix. I have to be able to modify it to meet my needs as an educator. And the no derivatives licenses don't let you do that. 
So choose the license you want. Um, and by the way, the we also have two public domain tools. If you want your work to go into the public domain today, you don't have to die and wait 70 years. You can just apply a CC0 public domain dedication and put your work right now into the public domain, legally. That's CC0, that's the most open. Most educators, I will tell you, do not do that. Most educators are using the CC BY license, the, the attribution license, more and more. Uh, but all, all four of those licenses get used. So we proudly say we put the open in OER because without open licenses, really all you have are works that are in the public domain. And anything created since the internet started is not in the public domain yet. And it won't be for a long time. Right? Uh, a lot of people are using this. This chart's out of date, which is why I made the arrow. <laughs> uh, we just passed, uh, we're at about 1.2, 1.3 billion works on the web that have a Creative Commons license on it. And that, that is an extremely conservative number. Uh, we're working right now to get better metrics. Our hunch is it's probably closer to two to three billion works. And when I say works, I mean everything from images to movies to textbooks to academic courses, you name it. Uh, but the point is a lot of people are sharing. If you wanna see who's sharing and deeper statistics, we publish something every year called the State of the Commons. Uh, report. It's at stateof.creativecommons.org. You can just type in state of the commons. It'll be the first link. Okay, so this is all happening. Um, who cares? Does this matter? Does this make your life easier? Does it help students learn? What's the research? So there's been quite a bit of uh, research that's, uh, that's coming out recently. Uh, one is in the global south. So in the global south, there's a real interest in providing better access to educational resources, providing uh, it in mother tongue languages because most of the OER in the world is built in English um, and then probably Spanish, German, uh, Italian, uh, a lot of the European languages, but very little OER is produced in Kiswahili, right? Or, uh, or Ubuntu or others. And so there's a real effort to look in the global south about uh, what's happening. If you're interested in that, there's a big research project out of the University of Cape Town called uh, research on OER for development. Uh, I mentioned in uh, the United Kingdom, out of the Open University in the UK, is something called the OER Research Hub. Uh, these folks are working with faculty around Europe and around the world, uh, looking at uh, myths of OER, challenges and barriers to adopting, uh, cultural shifts, uh, all sorts of interesting issues. Um, there's a project called the OER Review Project. Uh, this is out of the United States at Brigham Young University. Um, they're at openedgroup.org. These guys um, have everything from uh, kind of a collection of all the uh, research from around the world, but they, and then they do nice uh, uh, summaries and synthesis of research so that you can read it in a few paragraphs and get the gist of it. But they also do, uh, do research themselves. Um, this was a study that they just did. It was a multi-institutional study, a meta-analysis um, and 6% more students were likely to pass their classes. These guys have also done research that shows that when you move your course to open resources, uh, fewer students drop out to the tune of about 15%. More students stay in your class during the add drop period. Uh, to the extent that students are paying tuition or not, if they take a class, that's a big increase in tuition collection for universities and colleges. Um, time to degree is going down because students can afford to take one more class each semester because you're driving the cost of their textbooks to zero. And so that's, that's important. Um, and we're also seeing, uh, and I'll go back to the research in a minute, we're also seeing uh, student uh, performance or other outcome indicators going up. And that's for at least two or three reasons. Uh, the faculty are more engaged with the content because the content's openly licensed. The faculty are actually getting into the content and modifying it because the faculty know it can be better. I mean, how many of you are faculty here? Okay, so have you ever had the experience where you got a, a resource from a publisher and you said, that's an error, or that's not quite right, or I would have done it slightly differently, right? We've all had that experience as faculty. And with it, when it's an open resource, the faculty are actually going in and just changing it. They're fixing those things on the fly. Um, faculty that really get into OER are also starting to uh, generate new content, as faculty always do. 
and then they're openly licensing it, and uh, they're excited about that. The students are excited about it. And then we're also seeing student outcomes go up because of what we call open pedagogy or open practices. Faculty that are using OER in their classes and have been for some time are starting to ask questions like, what could I do in my class now with my, with my pedagogical approach that I could not do before? And the answer is, you can do all kinds of things you couldn't do before. Like I can give this group over here, um, so I, my, my PhD is in education psychology. Do we teach education psychology here? Probably not. <laughs> Maybe at the university across the street. So um, I, could, I could say to this group of four over here, um, there are, there's new education psychology, re well let me use physics. We'll use physics since we're at the Polytechnical. Um, there's new physics research that just came out um, and our chapter two in our open textbook is, is outdated. It doesn't have references to this new research. The research looks pretty good, it's peer reviewed, it's published in these journals. Um, your task, group of four, as part of your assignment is to read these research articles. I want you to synthesize them and incorporate them into chapter two. So you are now going to improve and, and bring current the textbook that our class used. And by the way, do a good job because the rest of the students in the class are gonna see your work. So if you plagiarize, everybody's gonna know it. If your writing is poor, everybody will know it. If you don't cite the resources correctly, everybody will know it. Do a good job. We'll send you to the writing center, we'll get you support. Oh, and by the way, it's not just our class which is gonna see your improved chapter two, but I'm gonna use this with the next group of students that comes through. Oh, and by the way, my book, my open textbook is up in a global repository, and so students around Italy and across Europe are also using our textbook, and they're gonna see your work. And so now I've just given them an assignment not only to improve the class, uh, but they're now doing something that they say, wow, my contribution actually matters. I'm not just turning in an assignment that's gonna get graded and then thrown away, which is not very motivating, but I'm doing something that's gonna contribute. And so they get excited about that. So um, back to the research. Um, 11 peer-reviewed studies, over 48,000 students in it, and the outcomes by the measures of various measures were 93% same or better. A lot of the times they're the same. And people say, well, I'm getting the same outcomes, so it's not any better. And the answer is, yes, that's true, you didn't, but you didn't do any harm, and you took the costs of the materials to zero, so 100% of your students on day one had access to the materials, which is better than what you have today. Okay, there was another, uh, this was about actual student outcomes. This set of studies was about the perceptions of OER quality. So initially, and certainly I was in this camp, people say it's free. Well, free is garbage. You get what you pay for. If it's not expensive, it, that means it's, it's bad, right? And so this was uh, uh, just over 4,500 4, professors and students. And again, you see this same or better uh, the, the faculty that, and the students that said worse, when we dug into that data and did some focus groups with those people, what we see in the research is when they say worse, uh, what was worse about the resources was it wasn't quite as pretty. It wasn't as glossy. Um, they were, you know, it was, a, it was a cheap printout in the bookstore and it didn't look as nice and therefore it wasn't as good. And we said, Okay, fair enough, but what did your learning outcomes say? Like, how did the students actually do? Did they learn what you were teaching them? Oh yeah, they learned it fine, but we really like this glossy version over here, and we said, well, <laughs> we can print it nicer, I suppose, if that's what you want. Okay, so what are some of the trends that we're seeing around the world? The first one is, uh, is in policies, and there are several different kinds of policies. Uh, one of them is that people with money, governments, foundations, institutions, are starting to say on discretionary optional grants and contracts. If you take this money, there's an open license requirement on it. You have to share what you create. If you don't wanna share, that's okay. Don't apply for the grant. So in my country, uh, we worked with the US Department of Labor. They give out $5 billion US a year in grants. They now require a Creative Commons attribution license on all of it. If you take that public money 
and you build anything. And uh, two years ago, three years ago, they gave out $2 billion to US community colleges, to 800 colleges in the United States. To, and each one of them was building one or more degree programs. So each one of these grants was about 20 million US dollars. They were building entire degree programs. All of those degree programs are under a CC BY license. So you could download all of them this afternoon if you wanted to. They're at skillscommons.org. You can take them. They're all yours. But the idea was the public paid for these. The public should have access to what they paid for. Um, so that's, that's one thing that's happening. Foundations are starting to do this. This is happening both with educational resources and with research. If you take a research grant from the Wellcome Trust in the UK, they require a CC BY license on the article. You have to publish in a, a journal that it has an open access option so everybody on the planet can read the research. And more and more, they're requiring that your data sets are made available to other researchers as well. The Gates Foundation, which funds about two thirds of the public health research uh, right now, especially across Sub-Saharan Africa, they have a new open access policy that requires the same thing. You've got to publish openly. So what's the, why are we doing that? What's the problem? Well, the, this, this isn't, well, the problem is that the default terms of public, publicly funded educational resources are all rights reserved. So this is normal, right? The Italian government on a regular basis gives grants for somebody to build educational resources and they don't have to share what they build even though all of you as taxpayers in Italy paid for the resource. This happens in every country, by the way. It's not just you. Um, the resources are not open and licensed. Public doesn't have access to what they funded. That is, taxpayers don't get access to what they paid for. The solution is very simple. You put an open license requirement on the optional money. And again, what's important here is you're not forcing people to share who don't want to share. What you're saying is this is optional money. You don't have to take it if you don't want to. But if you take it, you have to share what you build. Now, from a, from a funder perspective, this is hugely more impactful and efficient. I, we were, I was telling a story this morning at a meeting with your vice rector about uh, when I sat down with the, both the US Department of Education and the Department of Labor recently, and I asked one of their program officers, I said, what do you do? What do you fund? And she said, oh, I have a, a portfolio. I fund workforce development programs. I fund programs, education programs that, that retrain people where there are jobs. And in the United States, that's things like wind technology and green tech and advanced manufacturing. And that's where the jobs are. And what she was doing was she was going to fund Michigan with $500 million this year. And next year, she was going to fund Texas with $500 million to build the exact same program. And then the next year, she was going to fund the state of New York to build the same program. Right? And she was going to do this with all the states and the US territories. And I said, OK, fair enough. What if you fund Michigan this year and require an open license on everything they build? And then everybody can just have it. And then next year, you can do something else. And she said, oh my gosh, can I do that? And the lawyers in the room said, yes, we can do that. It's fine. And so now they have this policy, tremendously more efficient than what they do now. This is what we like to say. So next week, when I'm in Slovenia with the ministers of education around the world, this is my one slide with them. Ministers, please require that publicly funded research and educational resources are openly licensed. We already talked about this. Come back. Come back to this. Yeah. Oh, I'll get out of the way. You can have the slides too, they're all yours. So it's better, well thank you, that's very nice. We can be friends now. So uh, if you wanna see all this stuff, if you go to skillscommons.org, this is just one grant, right? Countries, every national government on the planet gives out grants all the time. I've got a friend sitting down today with the national government in Bangladesh and he's negotiating uh, with the government to require Creative Commons licenses on everything that the Bangladeshi government funds. Now they have a lot less money than the European Union or the United States or China, but still, it's gonna make a huge difference in Bangladesh. Because right now in Bangladesh, all of education, primary and secondary and higher education is funded by the national government and they fund resources in primary and secondary education, 
but they, the people in high school, in Bangladeshi schools, will not share with the universities, even though the universities in their developmental courses want to use some of those resources. It's all publicly funded. That's insane. And so the government has to pay again to have the universities build the same resources, right? And so they're trying to share. <laughs> they're trying to spend the money once. Uh, this is an example from the United Kingdom uh, where the schools in the United Kingdom and the city of Leicester said, hey, our content is 10 years out of date. We can't afford new curriculum. The new models are that our, we don't get to retain a copy. We want our students to be able to uh, to get motivated and contribute to the knowledge we use in the class, but everything we have is all rights reserved copyright. We've got to move to open educational resources. And so the city council said, well, we, have, we, we control your contracts, teachers of the schools, and your contract says everything you build, your work for hire. You, we pay you, you build it, we own the copyright. And so as the city council, we're gonna give you permission, if you want to, to put an open license on what you're building in class, and we give you permission to use OER from around the world and bring it into your classrooms, modify it, change it, have up-to-date content. So that's been a very successful project. So again, next week when I'm sitting down with the ministers, this is my second slide. Have an open license requirement, actually implement it. A lot of people have policies that never get implemented, and then follow up with the grantees. So that's one thing that's happening. I tell you that because as faculty, you take grants, from the EU, from Erasmus, from your university. Just be aware that people like me are out there trying to convince them to require grantees to put an open license on what they build. You're gonna see that more and more often. The flip, so that might sound bad to you. The flip side of that is if you, when you're applying for a grant, if you tell the funder, uh, hey, I'm applying for a grant and I'm a good bet, you wanna choose me, because even though you didn't require an open license, I'm gonna put an open license on my work, which means it's gonna see more distribution, it's gonna have a greater impact, and the odds of you getting that grant over somebody else go way up. And so if, you'll, if, if you just say that in your application, or if you say, so for example, at this institution, you already have an open access policy here, a very strong one, I understand. You should say that in your grant applications when you're doing research. We have an open access policy. People, anybody in the world can read our research. We're a better investment for the grant. Next major trend, and please shout out questions as you have them. Next major trend is open textbooks. So we use a lot of resources in our courses. Textbooks are only one. The reason that the open ed movement is looking at textbooks is they're expensive. Are they expensive here? Yeah. How much does an average textbook cost at the university? 50 euros. The average cost of, a, the, average cost of the, uh, the top 50 highest enrolled courses in the United States is $157, I think. So about 100 euros. That's the average cost. Some are less, some are more. This is a project in Poland. Uh, Creative Commons is a team in Warsaw and some people in Krakow. And in Poland, uh, in primary and secondary education, the parents have to pay for the, the books for their children. And if you're a parent who doesn't have very much money, you either pay for rent and food or you pay for textbooks for your kids, but you don't have enough for both. And this, this was about half of the public school kids in Poland. So roughly half of the kids don't have books and their parents say, please make friends with a rich kid that does have books. I mean, it's very sad, right? We live in this world of information abundance and we still have this type of thing happening. And so our team and the Creative Commons team in Poland went to the president. Uh, one of the team members actually worked in the president's office and said to the president, did you, did you know that half the kids don't have the resources they need to learn. The president said that's terrible, but what can we do about it? Uh, it's cost prohibitive, and they said actually it's not. We can do open educational resources. 
And so they, um, they already had a big digital initiative in their schools where they were trying to get more computers in the schools and raise literacy skills about how to use the internet and find information. And they tacked on to that program an open textbook project. I think they spent, uh, at a national level, about 11 million US, so I don't know, 8 million euro, something like that. It wasn't very much money. Even for a national government in Poland, it was a rounding error on the budget. It just wasn't very much, 8 million euros. And they gave that money to a, a nonprofit which put out open RFPs, open contracts, to anybody that wanted to write these books. It could be a commercial textbook publisher. It could be a group of faculty from the University of Barcelona. They didn't care. They wanted the best product at the best price. The copyright was gonna be held centrally and they put a Creative Commons attribution license on the resources that were built so that everybody could have access. Now they haven't built all the books yet, but they've built several and now the books that they've built, every kid has access to those books. Not only are these books better and more current, but everybody can access them now. Um, this is a chart from my country showing the, the bottom line is the, consu the consumer price index, the, the overall cost of all goods and services, creeping up over time from 2006 to 2017. Anybody wanna guess what that top, that top yellow line is, the, co the cost of? Textbooks. <laughs> this line, the blue line, is the cost of going to college. The yellow line is the cost of textbooks. The cost of textbooks has gone up. I have to look at my notes. Um, Eighty-eight percent in the last in that time period. Right. We talked about the negative effects of the high cost of resources in college classes. Here's what their research shows, and we see this. We see these same numbers in country after country as surveys are done. Um, about roughly two thirds of students in a class do not buy all of the resources that the faculty have assigned. Have you ever had students in your class not buy every book that you assign them to buy? Is that a problem? Right, you, you, if, if you didn't want them to have access to the knowledge, my guess is you wouldn't have assigned the book. Right, so it's a problem. And when they don't have the resources they need to learn, they're not going to learn as well. That's the main reason why when you shift a course to OER, we see learning outcomes go up. Big, big surprise, right? When people have what they need to learn, they actually learn better. What a shocker. 50% okay. of students say that the cost of textbooks impacted how many and which courses they took. So there's two ideas here. I wanted to take three classes, but because of the high cost of textbooks, I can only afford two. This happens a lot at when people are taking just a few classes at a time. Not full-time students as much. And then the which classes. I really wanted to be a mechanical engineer, or I really wanted to be a nurse, or I really wanted to be a designer, but the textbooks in those fields are just prohibitively expensive. So I guess I'm gonna have to do something else. We see that over and over and over in surveys of students. And then 82% of students said, you know what? I would have done better had all the materials been available, made available for free for me on day one. Students aren't stupid. They know if they have the resources to do well, they're gonna do, they're gonna do well. Now the good news, there are lots of open textbook projects uh, all around the world. This is a big one that started in the United States. It's now branching out into the United Kingdom and Australia uh, called OpenStax. This, this comes out of Rice University um, in Texas and they uh, are building textbooks for the highest enrolled classes that every university on the planet teaches. So everybody, every university, um, I mean the Polytechnic is a bit different because you're so specialized, but every general, every liberal arts uh, university teaches chemistry and biology and statistics and math. And we know what the highest enrolled courses in the world are. And they are building the books for those. Every time they launch one of these books, oh and by the way, all these books are free and they're all under a Creative Commons attribution license, and you can download them in four or five different digital formats. PDF, they're on the web. You can pull them down in um, uh, eight, uh, XML format if you wanna hack the code. You can pull them down in EPUB format if you wanna read them on your iPad or Kindle or whatever. 
Um, you can pull them down as you see fit. You want to modify them and improve them? Go for it. Another big trend is open degrees. We've kind of talked about this already. When you take the cost of textbooks at a degree, the degree gets much less expensive. So this is a big trend. Um, this is a big push in North America right now, in Canada and the United States. Um, we touched very briefly on open praxis, or people call it open pedagogy or open practices. I've talked a lot about the efficiencies of, of OER, that it's, all, it's more cost effective, that funders can get higher impact for the investments they, they make. Uh, it, it saves a lot of faculty that have moved to OER will tell you it saves them time. Certainly redesigning a course takes a lot of time. Developing new materials takes a lot of time, but as faculty get into OER, they start to get plugged into communities. They're on listservs. They're plugged into networks of other faculty that are also sharing content under open licenses. And then when they need something, they simply ask the network. So I'm on all these lists around the world. There's about six or seven big ones, and, and then a bunch of regional ones and country lists as well. But when a faculty member says, hey, I teach physics and I really need a simulation that teaches X that's got an open license on it, who's got one? If, if they can't find it, odds are somebody else already has or somebody else has built it. And so um, these efficiencies, as important as they are, and we do need to leverage OER for more efficient access to ubiquitous, high quality educational resources, I would argue they're the least exciting thing about OER. What's really important is the open practices piece. So faculty that have already shifted to open content are now starting to say, what does open allow me to do that I couldn't do before? Now this is the education psychology professor in me preaching. People learn when they do things, right? We know this. That's why we put them in labs. That's why we put them in internships. We put them in these authentic environments where they can actually apply their skills and their knowledge. That's when the deeper learning really happens. Copyright restricts what students are allowed to do with the content anyway. We know that. Open permits us to do new things. So how does this impact how people are learning? So um, just like the five R's, this concept of disposable assignments comes from our colleague David Wiley. And David calls these disposable assignments because this is what I had when I was in college. I got a syllabus. I knew how to get my A. I did the work. I turned it into my faculty. The faculty would grade it. They'd give it back to me. I'd get whatever grade I got. I threw it away. The faculty member threw it away. And I moved on. And we all hoped that at the end of the course that Cable Green learned something, which sometimes happened and sometimes didn't. But there was no contribution to the sustainable development goal challenges that the United Nations has laid out. There was no contribution to the university. There was no contribution to the class in making the content better. I knew that I wasn't really doing anything that mattered except improving my own knowledge which yes is important, and yes, that was the primary reason why I was at university, but I wasn't changing anything, and that's demotivating. And if you talk to any education psychology professor, they'll tell you the two things that matter most is put people in authentic learning environments and give them something that matters as they're learning. That's what's motivating. Okay, so disposable assignments suck. This is no fun. Nobody likes this, and it's a big waste of time. When, we're, when we have open content, we can move to what we call renewable assignments, where students are updating chapter two with the new research that's come out of physics. When uh, students can actually say, you know, um, that slide that you have, I actually saw something better because I was listening to the public radio station in Rome this morning, and there's new research that just came out that maybe you haven't heard about yet. And when the faculty member can say, that's amazing, great. Could you please add that to the course? But make sure it's properly cited and credited and linked, et cetera. Please contribute that knowledge, right? That's very motivating and exciting as a student. Okay, fine, so why should you care about any of this stuff that we've talked about today? So here are some of the reasons. Um, so this, this is what got me um, when I found out that two-thirds of students, uh, especially poor students, when I worked at community colleges, which tend to serve the uh, less affluent students in the United States, when they couldn't afford the textbooks, that made me angry. That was a social justice issue as far as I was concerned. 
There was a lack of equity. And when you move to OER, everybody gets access right away. Everybody gets to keep it forever. Another one is save money. This saves a boatload of money. There's a really interesting woman who was the CIO, Chief Information Officer at Oxford University. She's now at the University of Edinburgh. And she looks at this from um, a technology latency standpoint. Anybody a computer science professor in here? Nobody? Well, <laughs> at the Polytechnic, really? So computer scientists have this concept they call technical latency, which basically means as you're building software, if you build garbage on the, on the base, everything you build above it is problematic. And so what she did was she said, look, as we hire new faculty at, the university, at Oxford University and at the University of Edinburgh, let's encourage those faculty to put an open license on their work. And as they're doing that, we're going to engage them with copyright clearance processes and to make sure that they have the legal rights to, you know, let's make sure they own it before they openly license it. Or if it's not openly licensed, let's make sure that we've got the rights to use it. And then when they leave the institution, because faculty move around, when they leave the institution, we'll have this course. And we'll have it properly marked with the open licenses. And then when we hire somebody from the University of Milan to come in and fill the slot, we can say to that person, yes, you have academic freedom and you can build whatever you want and teach however you want. We also have all of these resources already if you want to use these. And they're openly licensed and you might want to modify them. And so it doesn't just save the students money, but it's starting to save universities time. Because oftentimes what happens is they say to faculty, we're going to give you a quarter or a semester to get the course up and running before you teach it. That's a lot of time that maybe they don't need to spend if somebody else is willing to share. Um, this is a calculator that you can use. If you just go to the web and type in open textbook savings calculator, it'll pop up. But you can put in lots of variables. How much do your students spend today on textbooks? How much would it cost to print them in your college bookstore, um, et cetera? Faculty care a lot about this, keeping content relevant, effective, and high quality. Uh, a lot of what the publishers do when they give you a new version, they move things around. Sometimes they put a DVD in it. Sometimes they have an online component. It's not always really value add. They're just trying to put out a new version so that you'll buy it. As faculty, we don't fall for this. We tell our students version 12 is just fine. You don't have to buy version 13. But nevertheless, content needs to be updated. Um, faculty are content experts in their fields. A lot of faculty are staying abreast of their field. They know what's happening and they are ready to update the content. If it's got an open license on it, they can do so. Um, and I hear this all the time from both faculty at universities and from teachers in primary and secondary schools, is they say, I, I'm a professional. I want to be treated like a professional, which means everything I do in my class, all the content I use, I want to have full authority to modify it any way that I want to, to meet my needs and meet the needs of my students. Because somebody five countries away does not know my students and they don't know what our needs are. They don't know the economic climate that my students are going into to get jobs. They don't know the local examples that I discuss when I'm in class. They don't know how I teach. And I need to be able to modify the content to meet my needs. So a lot of faculty who don't care about social justice and equity, or they don't care about cost savings, maybe they care about this. So uh, I was meeting with your vice rector the, uh, this morning, and this is what we talked about, is what uh, universities can do to support. The first one is to raise awareness, which is why they asked me to come here, was to <laughs> sort of share some of these ideas. Most people around the world don't know about this. Uh, you pick your country, 75% of faculty do not know about uh, open educational resources or open access research. And that's not their fault, There's, nobody's talked to them yet. So raising awareness is a big one. Um, the second one is universities and colleges are starting to provide support. This oftentimes they're hiring a new librarian that they call an OER librarian that helps people find content and helps take some of the burden off faculty in finding and curating quality resources. Um, they have instructional design teams like you have here at the institution that as faculty are redesigning courses, they'll go out and help find OER. They provide direct funding. So I've talked with a lot of faculty that at the end of 
one of my talks, the faculty will say, I'm sold. These, I, I, I agree. These are all good ideas. I wish I could do it. I don't have time. Cable, I teach a full load and I do research. I don't have time for this. I don't have time to go review different open textbooks and see what might work for my class. But if you gave me a semester off, if you give me a sabbatical to go figure this out, I'll figure it out. But I need some time. Or give me a research assistant who can go do that. I'll give them the assignment and they can go do that for me. And my doctoral student can bring me back the results. Right? So give me some resources to help me do that. And then um, a lot of times what people are doing is they're partnering with other institutions from around the country and around the world. Um, this should also be OER, uh, sharing your content, using other people's content, saving your students a bunch of money, making sure everybody has access, uh, publishing your work in open access journals. These are all things which should be recognized in a positive way when you are going through promotion and tenure review. Now, I was told this morning that you have a very strict, unique process in Italy about how you get reviewed as you move from assistant to associate to full professors. Um, but I would encourage you to look at that rule, that set of rules, and try to figure out where, when, when professors are going through that review, they could, they could say, look, I, I did this. I partnered globally. I shared my work, and it was used in five countries. I had an, an increase in impact here. We know that when you publish your research in an open journal, it gets read, which is what we want. We want people to read our research. It gets read 15 times more than research that's published in closed journals. Why? Because people can actually read it. <laughs> they can actually access the research. Right? OK, let me stop there. I've talked for a long time. And there's my information again. Let's chat. What would you like to talk about? Everyone's converted. Yes. Oh, should we have the microphone? Oh, we have a microphone too. In your presentation, you have focused mainly about textbooks. Could you please uh, share something uh, with us uh, about digital resources, uh, simulations, uh, and other kinds of uh, materials? Thank sure. you. Sure. So let me uh, bring up a browser here. Uh, here we go. So we were talking about this earlier today. Here's a nice example. All right, does anybody in here teach physics? Yeah, there's a physics professor, OK. So this is a project at the University of Colorado at Boulder. This project started because they had a physics professor named Carl Wyman who won the Nobel Prize for physics. He took his Nobel Prize money, and instead of buying a bigger house or a boat or something, he said, I'm an educator. I'm going to take this money and put it back into education. And he knew as a physics professor that, uh, that simulations were really helpful in teaching, people, teaching students difficult concepts that were new to them. Um, and so, for example, uh, I don't know. Let's choose bending light here. So um, so this is a simulation. All these simulations are interactive, meaning that all the variables, so I'll go ahead and choose the intro. So here's my, uh, my laser, my light beam. I can adjust the angle, and I can see what happens as it refracts. I can turn it into a wave. I can change uh, the air. Uh, the material that it's going through, this is what it looks like through water and glass. I can change uh, the type of the material, and I'm not a physicist. He could do a better job than I could. The reflection. the reflection, right? So I can, these are the variables that I can play with, and I can lecture to you about this, or I could give you a textbook about this, which is good, 
but I can also let you play with it for hours and manipulate the variables yourself. And let me go back here. And then, so there's hundreds of these simulations for chemistry and biology and physics and math. And what's really, so first of all, these are some of the best simulations in the world for those subject areas. They're all free. They're all under a Creative Commons license. And because there's some software, it's not just content, but it's also software that's running these simulations. The software is all under an open source software license. And so anybody in the world can download these, improve them, change them. Uh, if you don't like the words that are on the simulation, you can change those. Uh, people are, so let's look at this sim here. We could say, um, here are the translations. So this, this sim is available in all these languages. German, French, Finnish, here it is in Italian. Right here are all the, all the simulations that have been translated into Italian. So you could download just the Italian version. And then what's really cool is this section under four teachers. These are all educational resources that go with the simulation that the University of Colorado Boulder did not create. They did not pay for. This is just random professors, physics professors around the world that said, you know, I was using this simulation and I created a new activity for my class that was really successful. And so I'm going to write it up and submit it up here so that anybody else that likes this simulation can use it. And so people are like building these ancillary resources to go with the sim. Um, it, these simulations are so good that Pearson and McGraw-Hill and Cengage and these big big multi-billion dollar commercial textbook companies actually use these in their online resources because it's better than what they had. And so the textbook companies are now writing a check, a donation every year to FET and saying, first, thank you, we use your stuff and we sell it, we sell access to it. I mean, not, not it, but the books that, that have it in it. <clears throat> and we're, we're giving you money not because we're nice, we're giving you money because we want you to build more so that we can put those in our books as well. So we get this nice cycle uh, flowing as well. Um, so this is you know, one of many, many examples. One of the challenges, where's the one? There's, uh, they've got quantum phenomena. They've got everything you can think of in here. My favorite one is uh, static electricity and it's got John Travolta. Uh, and he's going like this, and he's like generating static electricity as he dances, and it, he touches things, and anyway. You can tell I don't teach physics either. Um, one of the challenges is, uh, the physics professor here, have you ever seen this before? Yeah, I don't know if this one exactly, but something similar. Okay. So most people don't know about OpenStax textbooks. That's a $25 million investment in textbooks that are openly licensed, freely available, and you could download all of them this afternoon in about 30 seconds and, and change them and use them. Most people don't know that. Most people don't know about FET. Most people don't know um, that the Erasmus Plus, everything they fund has an open license requirement. And you could actually go to the European Union and say, hey, I'd like to see all the products that have been produced with our European taxpayer money, because I might want to use it. Um, we don't know about these things. We don't know to ask those questions. Creative Commons, our, our role so far has been about building and maintaining these legal copyright licenses, these open licenses that everybody can use to share. And that's good. And lots of people are doing it. And it's increasing. And that's all good. But um, we have not done a very good job with the technology around the commons. So what we're doing right now is we're building a new search engine for the commons. So you're gonna be able to come to Creative Commons Search. Now we already have CC Search, but it's not very good. We're building a brand new search engine which will essentially search everything that's already in the public domain and everything that has a Creative Commons license on it. So you'll be searching billions of works um, around the world 
And so your search results will just be things that you can legally use. Now we've already, let me show you what we've got now. So today we have search.creativecommons where you can come in and search against particular repositories. But what we're building now is this new beta search, which looks like this. And initially, as we're developing this, we're just starting with images, just so that we can figure out with, the, with images how to best deliver results, um, so we're just working with the Rijksmuseum in the Netherlands, the New York Public Library, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and Europeana, which is a, an EU project that uh, takes all of the uh, images from museums across Europe and puts them in one place so that anybody can find them. Um, not just the images, but the metadata about the images as well. And so um, somebody shout out a, a, an artist. Who's your... Who? You be, how do I spell it? You, you, you type it. Go ahead. We'll see if this comes up here. Okay, good. So, so you get your results. I'll choose this one. I like this one. So you see, as I mouse over them, it tells me a little bit, tells me the title, give, tells me the license, and when I click on the image, it says here's the title of the work, here's the creator of the work, here's the license, this is under a CC BY license, here's the original source, so I can go right to the original, which is, let's see where that is here, looks like it's up in Flickr here, and over here, is the attribution statement. So the title of the work, the author is under this license and I can just copy. So that's copied now, it's on my clipboard. And so if, I'm, uh, if I wanna use this work in my class, I can download the image very easily, the high resolution image. And then all I have to do is hit paste. And it's gonna take that attribution statement, the credit, and put it right in my document. And I, I'm done, it's that simple. So we're trying to get to this space where you can search the commons, you can have one click attribution, and we're starting with images and the art world. The next thing I, I hope, I think we're gonna do is educational resources. And so uh, in educational resources, we've got some pretty good metadata that have been developed globally. Things that you would expect to find, title, author, subject, grade level, um, what type of resource it is, what format it's in, things like that, things you'd want to search against, when it was pu pu publication date. And so you, in the very near future, will be able to go to the Creative Commons search and say, show me all of the physics simulations that have one of these licenses that are in Italian. Only show me that, right? And you'll get back your results. So that's what we're building right now. Sorry, that was a long answer to individual resources. Other questions? Was anything confusing about what I talked about? Yes. Thank you very much for the an inspiring talk. Uh, could you add a little, a little bit more on a non-commercial license? Mm. What does it mean if I publish a book, a commercial book, and I use one figure that is uh, I get, I, can, I get from uh, this uh, website, uh, I cannot use it? Good question. Let me just bring, <clears throat> I didn't show you what the actual license looks like, so let me show you that. So this is what the licenses uh, look like. So this is the attribution non-commercial license. Thank you. So uh, if you use a work that has an attribution non-commercial license, you have to give attribution. And you may not use it primarily for commercial purposes. Obviously, you'd have to, some things might be viewed by a court of law as a commercial purpose, and other things would not be viewed as a commercial purpose. Um, but essentially what non-commercial means in our world, in education, 
is you cannot sell access to the resource. Now, non-commercial is a bit problematic in education because uh, faculty here might be confused and say, oh, you know, I, I work at the Politecnico and we charge tuition, and tuition is, do is euros, and that's a commercial transaction, and so I guess I can't use NC licensed materials in my class. That's not true, you can. That's perfectly okay. What you cannot do is you can't say to your students, um, here's this NC licensed work, pay the university an extra 10 euros to access it. That would be a violation of commercial. It would also be a violation to take the non-commercial work and print it and sell it in the bookstore for a profit. That would be a violation. But what you can do, what's okay, is to take a non-commercial work and print it and put it in the bookstore and sell it to students. That's okay as long as there's no profit. So you can, uh, the bookstore can uh, cover all the costs and even cover the overhead costs to pay for the lights and the air conditioning and the staff and whatever, right? They have uh, 15% overhead cost. That's okay. But they just can't charge a 25% markup on it. And so, but because you and I just had to have that conversation about non-commercial, that's one reason why a lot of educators just don't use non-commercial because it causes confusion. There's a big lawsuit as well in the United States right now about non-commercial because uh, the state of New York took $40 million and built some really high quality OER for primary and secondary schools and it became very popular across North America. And by popular, I mean 85% of the schools are using it. So it's everywhere, almost everywhere. The schools, so they have all these digital OER, but most schools around the world, not every child has a digital device. And so they have to print. And they need to give print copies to the students. Most schools do not have high capacity printers, so they have to go to the print shop. They have to go, in the United States, they go to Kinko's or Office Max or one of these big stores that has big printers. And they go in and they with a stick and they say, here, this has a Creative Commons license on it. I want 3,000 copies for my school. And fine, okay, it's gonna cost so much per copy and they pay and they go back and they give it to their students. So that's all fine. Uh, except that the state of New York put an NC license on the works, be mainly because they didn't have a good policy that's a whole other story we'll have over a beer. Um, but what they, if they just would have put a CC BY license, we'd have no problem. They ended up with a BY NCSA license. So attribution, non-commercial, share alike. That's the license that's on this $40 million of publicly funded educational resources. The vendor, the publisher that took the $40 million and built the content is the copyright holder, that was another policy problem. They shouldn't be the copyright holder. The state of New York or the federal government should be the copyright holder. But they didn't do it that way because they didn't listen to Creative Commons, so now the publisher holds the copyright. And they put a buy in CSA license on it, okay? The schools are going into the printers. The publisher is suing the printer, saying that they're violating non-commercial. Okay, so now the printers can't print, the schools can't get the content, use is done. That's a problem. So now we've got schools all over North America that want to use this, need to print it, but they're scared because of the lawsuit. Now Creative Commons and the printers are saying, the printers are fine. In the same way that if I had a non-commercial resource, from somebody in Paris, I could email it to you because you and I are friends and I send you this file. Did I violate non-commercial? Of course not. I send it to you though on Gmail. I have Gmail, you have Gmail. It went, on, it went to a Google server. Google's a commercial company. 
it went through a commercial transaction, does that mean we violated non-commercial? Of course not. And that's what the argument that we're making uh, is this. You just walked in to get printing done. They didn't make any, they didn't make commercial use. The licensee was the school. Whether or not the school sold access to the, re the resources is the issue, right? But because, again, this is complicated, right? Here we are having this conversation, and the schools are scared to use this stuff. And so when, when, when I work with, when I'm with the ministers of education next week, I'm going to beg them, when you make open licensing policies, please, please use a CC BY license. Use the simple Creative Commons attribution license. Because then educators can just do what they want to do. Right? They'll give each other credit. Non-commercial isn't even a very good commercial deterrent. I've talked with the commercial publishers about this. I said, if you wanted to use non-commercial in your commercial books, could you do that? And they'd say, oh, that would be easy. We would just give it away. As a lost leader, we would say, here, here's this non-commercial content. It's free. Oh, and by the way, we have this really expensive textbook which goes along with it quite nicely. And so there's easy ways to get around non-commercial. So I, uh, when you're choosing your licenses, and I had that list from most open to least open, try to be as open as you're able to be. Because if, if you think about it, when we share, the, reason, the main reason we're sharing is that we want other people, other educators, to be able to use our content. And we want that to be as easy as possible, right? And so make it easy for them. Is it, did I get to your, okay. Other questions? Thank you. Yeah. So, possiamo veramente ringraziare Cable Green, prendiamo anche l'occasione per, uh, we take also the occasion uh, for uh, uh, sharing with everybody that uh, all the materials that we have developed on Polymy Open Knowledge are shared under Creative Commons licenses, so we have uh, two, no, uh, each uh, teacher can decide which kind of uh, of a license uh, he uh, prefers, and usually the, uh, they choose uh, the license uh, about with uh, attribution and non-commercial and share alike. This uh, is uh, the, the license that is more uh, used in uh, Polymy Open Knowledge, but each teacher is uh, uh, it's free to, to choose uh, the license uh, that uh, respect better uh, they, uh, uh, his expectations. So, thank you very much, thank you. and uh, I hope uh, to have uh, you uh, uh, more times here uh, in our university. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well. Yeah.